news is that everyone is a potential victim. But the good news is that everyone is a potential solution. Welcome to everyone uh, to this session. I'll be moderating the session for today. We have about 40 minutes. And um, we have a key speaker, uh, Pat Money. I'll introduce him shortly. But first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Bridget Mugambe, and uh, I work with the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa as program coordinator. I am based in Uganda, and I am honored to be uh, here with you for the next uh, 40 minutes. Um, we have um, a good presentation from Pat. I think it's not on PowerPoint, but he should be able to speak to us. And um, he will share with us um, a talk on challenging the feed the world narrative, blockchain technology versus uh, trading in territorial markets. Pat will take about um, 20 minutes uh, to speak to us. And thereafter, we'll have an introduction if there are any questions or any thoughts from um, the side of the participants. Uh, they'll be welcome um, after Pat's talk. Um, to introduce Pat, um, Pat Muni has more than four decades experience working in international civil society, uh, first addressing aid and development issues, then focusing on food and agriculture and commodity trade. Um, in 1977, uh, Pat co-founded the Raw Advancement Fund International which was later renamed the ETC Group in 2001. He's received um, a number of awards, um, including the Right Livelihood Award, um, the Pearson Prize Peace Award from the Canada's Governor General in 1988. He also received the American Giraffe Award given to people who stick their necks out. Um, Pat Moon is widely regarded as an authority on issues of global governance, corporate concentration, and intellectual property um, monopoly. Uh, Pat, you're welcome to this session, and uh, please feel free to share with us um, the talk that you've prepared. Thereafter, we'll have a more detailed uh, interaction. You're welcome, Pat. Thank you very much, and, and uh, uh, very much for, for letting me be here. It's, I very much remember being in, in Senegal a couple of years ago uh, for the last AFSA meeting that I was at, and, and uh, how much, what a wonderful time that was. I'm sorry it's such a disembodied gathering this time, but it seems to be going very well. And so secondly, can I really thank the organizers and the technicians who I think are doing heroic service here. I've been listening to some of the other sessions and, and, uh, and I, I think it's, it's amazing how well this is working and congratulations. Um, I've got a lot I want to say and it's complicated um, and I want to make sure that, that there's lots of time for discussion. So I'm, I'm counting that our, our moderator will hold me to the 20 minutes and cut me off and remind me when we get close to that 20 minute time zone so that uh, I'm not unfair to, to, to the discussion that should take place. Um, there's several things happening at the same time here, and I, I, I will stick to the issue of blockchains and territorial markets, but I, I want to contextualize that first. Um, at this time, in part only because of COVID-19, oops, and I should slow it down because I'm talking too fast. Uh, it's not simply a question of, of COVID-19 that this it's creating a crisis at this moment. We are at a point where several things are happening at the same time. One of them is um, a vast new change in technologies, uh, which is, is uh, coming more rapidly than we expected. I had a chance to talk about this at the last AFSA meeting, um, and it's, it's become what I warned about and moving more rapidly than I would have expected even a couple of years ago. That's happening at the same time as we're seeing uh, a strong demand and recognition that territorial markets are just about the only thing that's going to get us through the series of crises that we should expect and are in even at the, at the present moment, which is again is not simply uh, pandemic, bad as it is, uh, not simply a food crisis, bad as it is. 
It is also, uh, of course, the climate changes that are taking place that are reflected in, in the pandemic and, and major structural changes in finance and market control that are, that are underway, which are not entirely related just to technologies. Um, so that's kind of the environment that we're in. Um, it leads to several initiatives that are, that are moving us now. One of them is, of course, the structural proposals around a food uh, systems summit a year from now um, or 10 months from now, which is proposing changes in how the whole food system will work. And that behind that is um, a new proposal for uh, multilateralism, how the multilateral systems should work and should change in the in the years ahead. Um, so those come together. And uh, that again puts again more pressure on territorial markets. COVID-19 has done us one favor perhaps, which is to expose the vulnerability of the industrial food chain. Uh, how uh, the supply lines of the industrial food chain uh, break down, uh, how uh, companies didn't even know their own supply lines sometimes, didn't understand the complexities of those supply lines and, and um, have uh, floundered uh, in the process and how poorly in many ways their technologies have served them as they've tried to struggle through COVID-19. So that that's puts back to us then a recognition that territorial markets um, really are a safer approach to, to food security and to our long-term survival. And those uh, supply chain, uh, the, the, the territorial markets, um, really have a justification uh, in the world that they may not have had uh, six months ago even. Uh, in September, we had a report from the European Commission, which looked at the vulnerability of the European Commission to um, market disruptions because of long supply chains. And it was a very interesting report because the European Union concluded that there were something like 30 major uh, products, raw materials as, as they called them, which um, show were very vulnerable to, to a disruption and that Europe had to move quickly to protect itself from external uh, control of those 30 raw materials. And the, the commissioner for industry in the, in the European Union uh, made the statement that gone are the days when Europe can trust on the beneficence of, of uh, the rest of the world to, to secure its, its, to make sure it's, it's secure in its raw material supply. Europe has to go it alone. Well, that's uh, an argument for Europe to in a sense have a territorial market to a very large one in this case, but to still to protect itself from the vagaries and vicissitudes of, of nature and, and, and the marketplace. Well, if Europe can say that, and by the way, that's been said in Canada and the United States and Australia and China as well, then uh, certainly Africa could look at its territorial markets and say, we need the same kind of protection, especially for food security, for our food supply. And we need to develop that. And, and I think it's very hard for other countries to look and say, oh, no, this, this, it's just for us to be concerned about our access to cobalt, which of course is from the Congo, um, it is, uh, that's a different thing from um, uh, people in, uh, in Abidjan or wherever is being concerned about uh, their food security. Well, of course it's not, it's, it's much more important to be concerned about food security. So there is now an opportunity to say that in order to have long-term security for the next pandemic, the next food crisis, the next climate catastrophe, uh, territorial markets in Africa must be strengthened to get us through that. And the industrialized North can't complain about that. So there's, there's a, I think, a real chance here to talk about regional treaties and national rules that break through uh, intellectual property controls, that break through the kind of uh, negative regulatory systems in most marketplaces in, in, in the food markets to give priority to uh, food security in Africa and through, ter through territorial markets. So that that's, to me is a very encouraging opportunity now. And if I can just 
take it, say a little bit more about that and I'll go back to the to the what you wanted me to talk about around technologies but but um, to say that if we look over and, and I'm speaking here now globally if we look globally over what's been happening since the mid 1990s since the world first world food summit in 1996 for example at uh, how uh, societies have changed and markets have changed it's in many ways, not in every way by any means, but in some ways uh, heartening. We've seen a constant growth, which is uh, constant but increasingly uh, strong toward um, um, support for local markets around the world. We've seen a constant growth in interest in uh, more nutritional food systems that breaks out in being vegetarianism in some places or flexitarianism, but a trend of much more sensitivity towards uh, a more healthy and environmentally secure kind of food system. And that trend line has been growing again for a quarter of a century now. We also see a real growth in organic farming around the world, um, and we can call it uh, many other terms, but let's generally use that language of organic or, or at least no chemical farming. And, and that trend line is again, exponential really in the last uh, decade, especially. We see a, a remarkable growth in interest in, in support for commercial support for uh, fair trade food products. And I, all of these things, of course, have limitations and everybody here can quickly say to themselves, wow, we see the limitations of fair trade here and we see the problems of organic there and so on. And that's all true. But nevertheless, the trend line of popular consumption worldwide for, uh, in, in favor of, of organic, in favor of fair trade, in favor of, of uh, more nutritious food is there. And if you follow the trajectory, the, 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 the trend line, then you can see that we can go from perhaps as low as, as 1% to 5 or 7% today for some of these markets up to around 22% uh, of global interest in these in, in, in organic foods, for example, by around 2045 or so, which is not good enough, but shows that progress is being made and with increased energy and support across civil society and around the world, it's really possible to go beyond simply an increase of 22% over the next quarter century to perhaps 50% or even higher uh, with, with you know, more coordinated energy on our part and more pressure on game is broken and their supply lines aren't working and we can't rely upon them to solve our problems. So I, I think that's a, the positive context. The negative context is that, of course, uh, the largest companies in industry are saying to us that we have a series of crises ahead of us in climate and in, in, in biodiversity, in population, in um, a, a kind of food demand. And we have no land and water and we have no choice but to use the most powerful technologies and to, to, in order to use those powerful technologies, we have to have the, the access to the market and freedom to operate from governments that will let us provide those services, let us to provide those technologies to feed the world. And so there is, of course, on their side, uh, an attempt to kind of railroad us all, push us all down a path which says, we are your only salvation. You have to go with us and that's blockchains and digital DNA and, and uh, management of big data. In fact, the other day I was on a converse, conversation with people in a call where we recognized that we are just past the 100th anniversary of the use of the term industrial agriculture. It was just a little over 100 years ago that that term first came up. Until then, farmers thought of themselves and fishers and pastoralists saw themselves as providing food as food providers for their families and for their communities. Then a hundred years ago, they were being told, no, actually, you're not just that, you really are uh, part of an industrial food system. But today, in fact, uh, there's a bigger set of companies that are saying, yeah, actually, you're not really just an industrial food system. What you are is data. Agriculture is just data. It's a management of that data, uh, how we manipulate it, how we store it on clouds, how we access it, who gets access to it, 
um, how we interpret it with our logarithms that is, is what's important here. And that means that whereas a century ago, we moved from really local uh, production and local uh, resources to be used for, for agriculture to where an industrial model said that we, we have to use uh, machinery and, and chemicals and so on. They're a long distance away to now where we have a, a set of companies that are, that are saying, really, we just need to manage data. And, we'll, and that's the, the, the core and the control of our food system. So companies now like Amazon and uh, Microsoft and Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi and, and uh, Tencent are all getting into the game and are all moving that the controls of the food system and blockchains are part of that. And those blockchains can reach down from uh, the, the heights of Minneapolis or Chicago or London or Berlin and Frankfurt to really influence um, influence uh, the, mark, the, the territorial markets. So that's where the battle is. The, and, and I'm glad to describe that uh, big data system and blockchains further in, in the question period, if that's uh, gonna be helpful for you. But I, I'm afraid I'll be treading over ground that I stepped on a couple of years ago and, and the world has moved on. So let me say again more about how the major multinational companies, the big data companies, uh, see the, the, their way forward, how they, they, what, what they see they need to put in place to, to achieve uh, their control of our territorial markets. For them, the uh, World Economic Forum it was a very important uh, organization, one which um, made it possible for them to go to the UN Secretary General and call for a food systems summit. And that term systems is really critical there 10 months from now. Um, it is their move to say, uh, not just that we need to have a conference about the food situation, which we could probably all agree to, but we need to restructure the food system. And that's, that's the demand. But the restructuring they're proposing and what, what the, the big data companies need, again, is an acceptance of their technologies as the only solution to future food systems. The acquiescence of governments and civil society to say that we have no choice but to follow that path. Well, that, that's what they're suggesting. But they, 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 to get there, then that restructuring isn't just to have a summit, it is to reframe how the world even meets and talks and decides about agriculture. So the food system that they want to see come out of the summit is one in which there's what they would describe falsely as a kind of a, 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 a tripartite conversation that we need to get past the one country, one vote battlegrounds of, of the old UN system. We need to uh, get past the, the, uh, the battles between civil society and corporations. We need to sit down at the table together in a kind of multi-stakeholder system. You've heard that term often, disgustingly. Uh, we need to do that uh, to have a three-way conversation around the table to reason together and to come up with shared solutions to these things. So the summit is to really set in place the idea that governments shouldn't really act unilaterally or on their own, even collectively as a, as a system. Governments really need to have a, a careful conversation with industry and with civil society before decisions can be made or to make the decisions. And it all sounds lovely. It all sounds like a, a great conversation. We all get to be together around the table as equals. And of course, we know that's just nonsense. We're not equals around the table. First of all, corporations have always been at the table. They've never been away. And sometimes they're kind of under the table, uh, whispering in the ears of, of, uh, of the governments, but they've always been there. They never have been away from the table. Uh, uh, but they, they want a, a proper presence at the table now, and that's, that's a change. And they want to be able to coordinate the table better. They have to say at this stage 
that civil society must be present as well. They have to say that because it just doesn't look good to say it's just us big companies and you big governments that uh, need to talk. So they admit a space for civil society, but it's a very dangerous space because we see them creating their own course, civil society. They, they see, we see them already determining uh, who are the spokespersons that they want to hear from in the summit who will talk about civil society. Uh, let's, let's hear from the World Farmers Organization, bought and paid for by agribusiness, uh, rather than hearing from La Via Campesina. Let's hear from our pet trade unions, not from uh, those who work with the International Union for Food and Agricultural Workers. Let's uh, talk to uh, fishing trawler companies, not to artisanal fishers and so on. So it's their approach to, to these things that, that is going to dominate here. And, and that's very worrisome. Uh, I'm quite afraid that if we don't fight back now to defend territorial markets, and if we don't fight hard against the way the summit is proceeding, that we will find ourselves at the end of 2021, where we have what they will describe as being the new multilateralism, which is this so-called three-way roundtable conversation between government, civil society, and industry, which will really be a conversation between industry and governments, and one dominated by, by, by industry. That's, to me, the real threat. We've never been in a situation quite like this before. It's like the end of World War II, when 75 years ago, the United Nations was created, the Bretton Woods institutions were created, a whole structure of, of international organization was established, uh, including uh, all the monetary and trade institutions, uh, which uh, have carried us through the last 75 years. And of course, carried us through very badly. But now they're saying, as bad as that was, now they're saying that, that uh, we need to revisit all of that, restructure it this time. And, 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 and they're arguing that the, the problem with the, the old World War II system was that, again, it was just really governments in the, in the driver's seat. Now we've got to make this three-way conversation, which they will dominate. That's, that's the, uh, the context, I think, that we're in. Uh, the battle around the summit is that battle. Do we come out with, with a strengthened United Nations approach where civil society plays a strong role and industry is put in its place? Or do we end up with, with this, this phony multilateralism? And then do we recognize that the, as, as Europe has recognized, as Canada, the United States, China, and so on have recognized that the food system structure we have, the entire trade structure we have, is not strong enough to survive the tradition, the, the economic and, and environmental world that we're living in and moving into even more so. And we need to have control over territorial markets. So that to me is, is, is the, the critical battle ahead of us. The, um, I could say more about the summit. I could say more about this strategy towards new multilateralism or, or they can sometimes call it multi-stakeholderism. Um, or we can talk That's, more about the, the kind, sorry. Yeah, you have um, talked too long, haven't I? Yeah, about two minutes to wrap up. Well, I think that I'm timing it rather well in that case. Then I think I should probably let it go there and, and say I'm glad to again talk about either the, the, the technologies or the, the structure around the summit or to talk about the uh, this wider trend about uh, multilateralism. But, uh, and to say at the end of the day that I actually do think, maybe I should end with this, that the, there is really an opportunity now to pursue territorial markets in Africa and around the world uh, in a way that we couldn't have even thought possible six or seven months ago. So the timing for AFSA to actually make this a focus of, for AFSA is excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much, Pat, for that um, insightful presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone has got thinking about um, lots of things from what you've shared, the opportunities that we have um, as Africa to start pushing for territorial markets, but also some of the challenges. And um, of course, I would uh, open the space for anyone who wants to contribute, uh, ask uh, for clarification. Please feel free to raise your hand and I'll give it a little to speak. But as you 
as I wait for um, the attendees to raise their hands, maybe just to recognize that um, I think it's critical that, that um, what Pat has brought out is that the opportunity is right uh, now for us to push for territorial markets that have opened up with COVID, but also other um, uh, incidences that are happening, especially around climate change. So as we ask for, um, as we ask for clarifications, I think I would also love to hear. Um, you are on mute. You muted yourself. I'm sorry. Yes, I was saying that as um, as the participants contribute, I'd also like to hear from you uh, what you feel critical recommendations. How can we push for uh, territorial markets in Africa? What are some of the practical uh, steps that we can take? And um, based on what uh, Pat has shared with us, I see a number of hands uh, already up. Peter, Peter Gabos, please feel free to come in. Then after Papa Mesa from Senegal. Um, hello, Pat. Thank you for your, your talk. My question is whether you could clarify a bit more for us. Um, maybe you are not so familiar with the, with the issues. What is a territorial market? Are we talking about like here in West Africa, ECOWAS, or in French we say CEDAO? Is that a territorial market or are we talking about something smaller? Can you sort of describe a bit more what, when we're promoting or trying to advocate for territorial markets, what that consists of and whether, what are the main barriers to it? Because I thought there was already a, a movement in Africa towards integration. It's been there for a long time. It hasn't moved a lot. Um, and does that mean like territorial markets, does that mean less imported food from Europe and US? Or what does it mean exactly um, if you could just elaborate a bit on that. And a secondary question to that is just whether, you know, this, um, the African uh, move towards an African market, whether you see that as being part of the territorial movement as well. Thank you, Peter. Um, Pat, I suggest we take three questions, then you address those, or would you prefer to have um, all of them, then you respond at once? No, if you help me keep track of the questions, then let's let's do three at a time or so. Okay, okay, uh, Papa. Let me try to say it in English to interpret it by myself. It's a longer question. But okay, the current liberal economic model is it able to protect African territorial markets? This is one, and can it? secure the African market, uh, can it, it secure access to food? Okay, to food, access to, to the food they need. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, uh, Sonia. Sonia, are you there? Um, Hi, yes. Um, I would also like to know, um, with regards to the, the players that uh, will be seeking this um, new multilateralism, um, would the Eat Lancet diet, for example, be part of that push? And also the Green New Deal and the One Health, um, are, are these, it would be helpful to know um, with regards to the narratives that are, it's quite difficult to navigate the narratives. Um, so it'd be helpful to know who's actually pushing for this. Who are the main players? Sure. Thank you. Um, Should I? Yeah, sure, Pat. Well, first back to, to Peter. Um, I think the, I don't know there's a precise definition of the geography of a territorial market. I think of them as kind of the watershed for communities uh, that uh, where where the market would naturally lead if if there wasn't the pressure of regulation and international trade agreements. Uh, not to say that all regulation or all international trade agreements have to be bad at all or importing, importing and exporting has to be bad, but then the natural flow of products into into communities from from where they're grown and, and, and are fished. And 
uh, but that can change in, in again in size uh, for sure. But it's it's, lo it's it's local procurement. It's prefer preferencing the use of the land and the use of uh, access to food to to local communities, uh, and and to uh, uh, pr provide again not just uh, uh, local markets but fair markets as well in terms of, of uh, prices to producers and and price and cost to consumers. The uh, so they're they're relatively small markets. Um, Peter was asking wider issues around that, but it, I mean other movements to sort of protect markets and movements to to uh, and and not to be overcome by international trade agreements is is a is an element of that work certainly, but the development of local markets or territorial markets is I, is I think a very specific area of activity which. Um, is because of what's happening in the world these days and increasingly going to happen in the decades ahead, simply makes great sense to just about everybody and is again getting strongly supported around the world by, by producers and consumers. So, so I, uh, I don't, uh, maybe Peter may want to come back on that for more clarification. I thought some of the other areas, yeah. I uh, see so Mamadou would like to intervene and I think that he would do a better job of explaining territorial markets than I would that I can go back to the other two questions. Okay. Um, okay. I thought you'd first finish the other two questions, then uh, Mamadou can come in after that. Well, he wanted to jump in. He said uh, on this specific uh, question of, of what is the territorial market. Okay, Mamadou, could you come in? Okay. Thank you. Je vais parler en français, but I like to hear what I will be saying, and Peter. Uh, is there any interpretation coming in? Yes. Okay, so I will speak in English so for Peter. No, uh, because there have been a process actually at the CFS level. And then as you know, Peter, so this has been defining the territorial market. Uh, it's, 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 it's not um, talking about uh, regional economic commissions, no, I like ECOWAS. It's just this kind of market where um, you have been giving eight characteristics of this market uh, uh, as territorial market is linked to a uh, food system. These are the market where the big majority of food stuff will uh, go through and is characterized by the diversity of this market. And uh, the link that the market has with the food system in a given territory, it can be local, it can be cross-border even, it can be a national market, but uh, that the the, the, uh, uh, the most characteristic is that uh, uh, the, the, it's, a, it's a way when you have this triangle that is linked to each other, the, the production system, the, uh, 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 the adding value system to the product of consumption and, and, and market and the market system of the product. So this is uh, 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 also one of the characteristics that we have been given. So it, it's different from the global value chain. So the global market, where you have only less than 20% of the food stuff that will circulate, but the rest of this food stuff will circulate on this territorial market. They are territorialized in the sense that they are linked to the food system of a given territory, and also that the accumulation and the redistribution of wealth is done within the territory, uh, because uh, sometimes linked to the uh, local government, but also uh, with a food. Uh, system that is in the in the given area. So this is the mainly mm -hmm. the definition of it. It can be formal or informal, uh, because in some cases they have uh, 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 for some legal recognition uh, using taxation system, but it can be also informal, because the local market uh, concept has been just saying we minimize the the uh, the, uh, the role and place of this market in the food system, because this is where the biggest uh, part of the food. Will circulate. So it just to make this uh, uh, this clarity on the definition. So it's a, it's a, there is a discussion at CFS level on this, and actually we are trying to just see how to to do a kind of mapping of this so that decisions that have been taken can be implemented at different country level. Okay. Just wanted to add. Thank that. you so much for that. Thank you, thank you, Mamadou, for that. Very helpful. Yeah. And I could, should I carry on there with the other two questions? Yes, sure. But let me also just add to, to what Mom said as well, is I, I actually think we're at a stage again where, where COVID-19 has exposed so many problems 
that uh, with markets and, and supply chains that uh, we are in a position now where we can push further than we've been able to do in, at the CFS and, and get to a point of, of uh, at least regional treaties, if not international treaties that, that over time, that really entrench in place the primacy of, of territorial markets uh, above all else in, in, in what it's going to be a series of emergencies in the decades ahead. And there are all kinds of, of, uh, of systems in the UN and locations in the UN where uh, in, in the case of an emergency, you could argue for special conditions and, and the suspension, for example, of in theory of intellectual property rights or the suspension of, again, restrictive market conditions in terms of exports. So th there's real potential there now that we didn't have before. Second question that was asked was related to, to uh, uh, can the liberal system or the neoliberal uh, world really assure us of food security? I think if I can summarize as I understood the question and the answer I think is no, um, it hasn't so far and, uh, and, and, it, and it won't. Uh, but I think and this comes to the third question in some ways, I think we're moving into another era that sort of the, the era of liberal economies or neoliberal markets, depending on what language you want to use, um, that's, that's come out of the World War II and was pressed, uh, particularly since the 1980s as well, is changing. And we are seeing uh, a move by the most powerful financial instruments in the world to say, uh, we're tired of being under the table we really want to, to set the table and, and run the show. And it's time to push aside these almost 200 governments in the world that are really quite a nuisance and, and create a, a policy decision-making environment that, 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 we're, that we really are, are in charge of. And that's what we're faced with, with the move in the summit, the food system summit. And that's the biggest threat, of course, to territorial markets. And, and the pressure to, to adopt the technologies that these countries or these companies control and the data that they really want to control. And so there was a particular question, well, what does that mean about the Eat Lancet report or um, the, uh, I that there's now, the World Economic Forum, of course, did its own study on, on the food systems. And I think that uh, proposals coming out of the World Economic Forum, the ones from Eat Lancet, uh, raise some interesting issues and points and they have lots of data that's interesting and ideas, but they certainly do not challenge um, the kind of strategies now being pursued by the biggest companies through the World Economic Forum and the summit. Uh, we have about three, four hands up for questions. Jean-Marie, uh, René, Chantal, if you could go please, Jean-Marie. Sorry, I may not be pronouncing it well. Please unmute. Okay, merci bien. And uh, if you could keep it brief, if you could keep it brief, please, so that uh, we have the others also contribute. Okay, merci bien. Je crois que vous allez voir merci Monsieur Pat pour la présentation très pertinente. Moi, je voulais juste aborder un aspect en qui concerne les semences. Nous savons que nos marchés sont des lieux libres d'échange entre nos populations et aujourd'hui nous assistons à la problématique de cette technologie où par exemple nous avons ces semences améliorées qui envahissent nos milieux qui avec le risque d'exproprier nos populations de ce qu'il y a comme semences paysannes et en même temps une tendance à une appropriation du marché de ces semences là sur euh, nos territoires quand nous savons les liens vraiment culturels et sociaux de ces échanges, de ces semences au sein de nos communautés. C'est vraiment une préoccupation face à cette technologie qui rentre en ligne de compte dans ces semences qui sont vraiment vitales pour nos communautés. Je voudrais vraiment euh, voir ce que M. Pat pense de cela et s'il y a quelque chose à partager par rapport à, à cette problématique qui nous pensons être vraiment très sérieuse aujourd'hui, surtout dans nos pays africains où avec les changements climatiques, les langages qui est servi à nos populations, c'est de dire que cette façon de faire est la meilleure pour s'adapter, alors que nous savons que nos semences sont toujours, sont toujours, toujours adaptées à nos milieux, à nos réalités. Donc, c'est une technologie en sourdine qui s'intègre dans nos milieux et qui menace nos, nos marchés locaux en termes de liberté d'échange de, de nos semences et de nos produits alimentaires. Donc, je ne sais pas si M. Pat a quelque chose à dire par rapport à ça. Merci beaucoup. Um, 
Pat, did you get the question clearly? Uh, I know the interpretation was No, not at all. I'm sorry, I, need, I didn't have interpretation. I was actually getting the chat line being read in my ears. Mm. So I didn't Jean get it. Jean-Marie, you can pose the question. I will interpret it rapidly. Okay, so now okay, maybe we could put it in the chat uh, and more clearly. I, I, yeah, yeah, I got bits of it, but we could put it in the chat. Wait, did you put it? Clear. Um, no, we okay. request that you write it in the chat. Uh, then uh, maybe. Oh, okay, that for those who resume? Yeah, oh. yes. Thank okay, so um, no, it, sorry. Yes. No, sorry, but uh, if you write it in the chat. Okay. Il demande d'écrire ça dans la boîte de dialogue, d'écrire la question dans la boîte de dialogue. Okay. That's okay. Pamara, you read it out to us after. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rene, please briefly. Yes. Thank you very much, Rene Menager, iPhone International. Um, my question goes about. Uh, quantity. I'm working with uh, agroecological uh, groups in Burkina in Senegal, and when I see the quantities we produce, uh, for example, the onions, I uh, ask myself, do we fill even two truckloads of uh, ecological onions uh, in a season? And when I'm uh, looking at markets in Senegal, how many onions come into that market or when I'm sitting on the road in Burkina Faso, then I see uh, truckloads of onions coming uh, from abroad. Do we have a chance there? Do we have a, do we have a chance? Do we have an argument against food industry uh, by producing two truckloads of onions against uh, uh, what food industry uh, does? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's very clear. Um, Pamara has uh, Jean put down his question. If not yet, uh, uh, no, not yet. Not okay, yet. Pat, Pat, maybe you could come in as um, Jean puts down his question, and if it comes in, then uh, you'll address it. Then after that, we should be able. Oh, there is Chantal. Sorry, Chantal sent me a message. Chantal, please, could you come in briefly? Oui. Euh, bonjour tout le monde. Moi, je, je suis d'accord avec tout ce qui a été dit, mais je pense qu'on devrait un peu euh, établir un rapport de force sur le terrain, parce que on doit peut-être partir de, de tous nos outils productifs. Alors d'abord, il va falloir défendre la terre, parce qu'on a la terre à quéparer, défendre des ceintures vertes autour des villes, les semences, etc. Ça, ça fait partie des sept piliers de l'agroécologie paysanne que je viens de vous envoyez euh, le document par le fichier, là. Et je pense qu'il faudrait réfléchir par terroir, c'est-à-dire qu'on aurait besoin aujourd'hui euh, de mobiliser, d'être mobilisé dans les terroirs, parce qu'il euh, y a la produire et produire en agroécologie paysanne. Donc, ça demande de passer euh, une certaine étape et qu'il faudrait... Euh, Vraiment, on a commencé à le faire au Mali, travailler autour des communautés, dans des communes, dans des terroirs, dans des villages, pour que tout le monde soit conscient de tous ces enjeux. Et que la production, parce que tout le monde n'est pas prêt à faire de la production pour vendre en dehors de la, des petits marchés, pour avoir juste un petit peu d'argent, pour payer l'école, etc. Donc il y a tout un travail à faire de dynamique. On a un réseau qui s'appelle le réseau agroécologie paysanne citoyenne. On essaie de, mettre, de relier les marchés entre les paysans, les consommateurs et les transformateurs en mettant des marchés dans les quartiers. Et je pense qu'il faudrait vraiment se baser sur cette dynamique d'abord locale, parce que plus il y aura de dynamique locale, plus on pourra changer les politiques nationales ou régionales. Tandis qu'en étant toujours qu'au niveau des politiques nationales et régionales qu'il faut aller défendre, il faut pouvoir être plus fort sur le terrain. Et vraiment, la réflexion des marchés territoriaux, elle est liée à, elle est aux dynamiques territoriales autour de ces marchés, dont la première, c'est la sécurisation de la terre, la biodiversité avec les semences, les pratiques agroécologiques, les systèmes alimentaires, en mettant la place, euh, la place des femmes et des jeunes. Donc vraiment, il ne faudrait pas qu'on se décourage toujours, parce que oui, la politique libérale aujourd'hui, c'est compliqué à combattre, mais si on met tous nos efforts à des endroits et en s'unissant, je pense qu'on peut y arriver et... 
le manifeste d'agroécologie paysanne devrait, autour de ces sept piliers peuvent nous aider à réfléchir dans ce sens-là et à se faire des liens entre nous. Merci. Thank you, thank you, Chantal. Um, thank you. Uh, Pat, if you have responses to any of uh, those questions before we wrap up, please. I didn't get what Chantal said, unfortunately. There wasn't a, tr there wasn't a translation. Uh, it was mainly a contribution. Oh, yeah, for, for uh, Chantal, it was mainly a contribution. Uh, from Rene, yeah, I think Rene was asking about, he brought an important issue of, of uh, quantity yes, I got in that, our yes. market. Yeah. Um, for Jean-Marie, sure. I don't know if we've got the question yet. Uh, for Mara, yeah. Uh, well, could I suggest that, uh, could I suggest maybe, to apologize to Jean-Marie, I'm sorry that I couldn't get it. If you'd like to write to me directly. Okay. If you'd like to write to me directly by e email, I'll be glad to to talk with him directly uh, at another call or or via email. And I, I don't, I'll definitely pay attention. And okay. um, you can get my email address uh, through the organizers. I know um, to to Renee's comment uh, about the onions. I didn't quite get Renee what you're talking about imported onions or just uh, major productions of onions that are competing with small farmers in in the local market. But if it's um, an imported um, imported onions, um, that or any imports of that kind, I think that the the prior there's not easily now a way to argue for the primacy of the territorial market. But there is, I think, in a way, be, because of, if we describe this as an emergency situation, which the world is in, and which it will be in for the next several decades because of pandemics and climate change and other factors, then I think we can argue that, that um, imported food products can't usurp local markets. It's simply not safe for food security. And that can be treated as an emergency. Um, in the same way, we can also argue that, for example, intellectual property rights over farm machinery or over plant varieties, not just GMO varieties, but over, over conventional varieties even, the intellectual property rules around those have to be suspended through compulsory licenses, which is a, a tool that's there already, but has to be maintained over decades because um, it's, it's, it risks food security. We can use several, we can argue again that many regulations, many phytosanitary regulations, which are really mainly meant to keep uh, to control the local market, to, to prevent local markets of local farmer production. Those kinds of regulations have to be suspended because we are in what's going to be again a series of emergencies. So we have to establish those series of rules that say that anything which is a barrier, including land grabs, which prevent farmers access to land, uh, can't be allowed uh, in a world in which uh, we have food insecurity and where the insecurities are going to be increasing. So we need to lay those out. We don't have those tools in place now, where some of them are in place, such as compulsory licenses, but they're not being used. We need to establish conditions, political conditions, under which governments feel able to exercise those, those rights. Um, thank you so much, Pat. Um, I think we've, uh, we really need to wrap up now. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I know there is really still a hunger for the discussions to go on, and we have the next two days to still continue the same discussions, and uh, Pat will also be available. He's also open to um, emails, and he'll be able to share more information on email. Uh, maybe to wrap up, I know there are so many good points that came out, so many critical issues that we can take home, but maybe just to pick out a few um, that, that uh, I really uh, uh, got from the discussions. Uh, one, there's a growing interest in territorial markets and uh, definitely also informed by um, the current situation now, the, the COVID situation, but also other um, incidences like climate change. So we need to um, utilize that, that opportunity. And then also there are questions coming up on how do we take the space on a table that is clearly unbalanced, the discussions within the food summit uh, that is coming up, for example, those preparations. How do we take um, that space? How do we advance territorial markets without necessarily also getting compromised? Um, 
Then of course the contributions around the need to mobilize uh, at the local level, I think that's very critical. And uh, as African groups as AFSA, I think that's one of our strength and one of uh, the key points that, that we anchor on the need to mobilize and the strength to mobilize at the local levels to not only advance the markets, but also support them. Um, of course, it's an uphill task uh, for us as actors. Um, and we also, not only do we have to mobilize, but also at the political level, at the policy level, we need to be able to support our governments and push our governments to recognize the opportunities that are there in, in, uh, in territorial markets. So I think for Mr. Can I just throw in that I think Chantel mentioned a seven point strategy a document that Lavia Capacina has come up with. So I'd, I'd certainly commend the, the document. I think it's is in several languages. Um, Yes, yes, uh, LVC has come up with a good document. And uh, I think they've also put a definition of territorial markets quite uh, quite close to what uh, Mamadou Goita shared with us. So yes, I agree. Um, I think it's a good resource that, that um, I would encourage all of us to, to read through. I would like to really close this session uh, by thanking Pat. Thank you so much for taking time to prepare um, this talk. It was very insightful. I'm sure everyone agrees with me. Thank you for all of you who have taken time to participate um, in this session. And I hope to see you in the coming two days of the conference. Thank you and uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good night, depending on where you are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The coronavirus is sweeping over mankind. Everybody must be alive.